So it is the time. Um, today I would like to start the last chapter of this course, which will be about organometallic uh, chemistry. So organometallic chemistry is an important subset of coordination chemistry. Organometallic compounds uh, also play a very important uh, industrial role. So as part of this chapter, um, you will also learn about industrial applications of um, coordination compounds. So at the very beginning, let us uh, think about how organometallic chemistry and how organometallic compounds are being, being defined. So when we talk about the organometallic compounds, then we mean a complex with bonding interactions between one or more carbon atoms of an organic group or molecule and the metal atom. So there must be some direct interaction between the metal and the carbon atom. Only then we talk about an organometallic compound. So this also means that the presence of, of an organic ligand is not sufficient. Um, we call um, a complex metal organic complex when there's an organic group present, but this organic group does not make a direct interaction between um, the metal and the ligand via a, a metal carbon, metal carbon bond. But just to illustrate this by a very simple example. Um, so for instance, when we have tetrametal tin, would this be an organometallic compound or not? So do we have a dark dash between a metal and the carbon atom here? Yeah, we have. So we would say that this is an organometallic compound. And uh, to the contrary, tetramethoxytin is not. It is also a methyl group, okay? But this methyl group is bonded via an oxygen atom to the tin atom. Therefore, this would be an example of a metal organic compound, but not an organometallic compound. Okay. Um, so, as I mentioned, the uh, organometallic chemistry is very important um, in industrial applications. So, here just a few numbers to illustrate this. So, for instance, aluminum articles are being produced at a scale of approximately 50,000 tons per year. Tin articles are produced at a scale of about 35,000 tons per year. But much more important than the production of organic, organometallic compounds is the production of other chemicals using organometallic compounds. Okay. So, for instance, uh, polypropylene is being produced by using organometallic catalysts at a very, very large scale. So, um, in this case, about 17 million tons per year. Polyethylene also. Another way um, common polymer is produced with the help of organometallic catalysts at a scale of uh, 36 million tons a year. Also many basic organic chemicals like for instance, acetaldehyde or acetic acid are being produced using organometallic compounds, organometallic catalysts at, uh, millions of, at the scale of millions of tons per year. Okay, so how has the field of organometallic chemistry evolved? I wanted to give you here a, a brief history of organometallic chemistry. So it is believed that the first organometallic compound that was synthesized uh, was cacodyl and cacodyl oxide. And it is believed that it was synthesized first in 1760 by by accident, so um, uh, Louis Claude Cadet worked on inks and accidentally discovered cacodyl and cacodyl oxide as part of the work. So, what are cacodyl and cacodyl oxide? Um, so, if you see here the structure of cacodyl, so you see here we have a compound with an arsenic, arsenic 
uh, bond. And we have these four methyl groups attached to the two arsenic atoms. And chiral oxide has a similar structure. It's just that uh, an oxygen atom is here in between the two arsenic acids. Uh, so these compounds have a very strong smell. They have actually a garlic-like smell. You can actually use them to identify arsenic. So if you have a sample and suspect that there's arsenic in your, in your sample, then you can heat your sample together with uh, potassium, potassium acetate. And then um, the arsenic in your sample uh, which is usually in the form of um, ACE203. For instance, if you want, if somebody wants to poison your food, yeah, um, put arsenic oxide into your food, you take a sample of your food and then heat it, and if it's giving a very strange garlic like smell, then that is, then this may be capital or capital uh, oxide. Okay. Um, so another important milestone was the discovery of, of Cyrus, Cyrus salt. So um, um, William Cyrus found in the year 1872 that when you heat uh, hexachloroplatinate anion with platinum deoxidation state plus four in in ethanol, then there's a reaction between that that anion and that that ethanol, and you get get a compound of which you could determine the composition. And the composition was um, NaPtCl3C2H C2H4. And the unusual thing about this compound was that it contained well. Uh, two carbon atoms and four hydrogen atoms. So in some way, the ethanol um, must have reacted with, with the compound, but it wasn't clear how, and it wasn't clear in which form uh, these two carbon, these hydrogen, four hydrogens were uh, bound or bonded in the respective uh, complex. Only more than 100 years later, the structure of this compound was actually determined by single crystal X-ray diffraction, and that revealed the first olefin complex. So, in an olefin complex, an olefin is bound um, side on to a transition map. Um, you can see this from this structure here. So you see that the platinum is in a square planar environment. You see that these three uh, chloroligands, they're all in, in one plane with the platinum. And ethylene is, being, is, 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 the, is the fourth ligand. But you see that in contrast to uh, conventional bonding, uh, not a single carbon atom binds to the platinum, but both of them bind equally to the platinum. So you can see this from the platinum carbon distances. You see that here we have a platinum carbon distance of 216 picometer, and here it's 215 picometer. So this is practically the same. And from the bond length, bond strength principle, you can estimate that there is significant bonding interaction in that. Uh, both platinum carbon bonds are approximately, approximately equal. What is also noticeable is that um, the, the ethylene unit here stands perpendicular to, to this plane. So it binds actually side on to the, to the transition metal. And what's also noteworthy is that the carbon-carbon uh, bond has a bond length, which is in between the bond lengths for an ethylene molecule and an, an ethane molecule. Okay, So the bond is actually longer than that of a free ethene. 
Okay, so for a free ethene, we would measure 134 picometer, but we measure here 144 picometer, and that indicates that the bond order within the ethylene molecule is actually decreased. Okay, but it's still higher than a, than a single bond. So we would think of this carbon carbon bond here as something in between. Uh, a carbon carbon double bond and a carbon carbon single bond. Okay, and that could be explained by uh, the donation of, of pi electrons from uh, the ethene molecule into the uh, metal D orbitals. So, how would that exactly work? Well, you see here the pi orbitals of the ethylene, and you see that the lobes of the pi orbitals of the ethylene can overlap with the lobes of metal D orbitals in a sigma fashion. Okay, so we have here actually a sigma donation of pi electrons into metal D orbitals. So if we remove electron density from the carbon carbon pi bond, then we weaken the bond and we reduce we reduce the bond bond. Um, in addition to that, the ethene molecule also has pi star orbitals shown here. So these pi star orbitals have uh, a node, obviously, and because of that node, they are now suitable to overlap with metal B orbitals in a pi fashion. So now the pi star orbitals of the ligand are empty, okay? But we may have, or we do have um, electrons in a metal D orbital that can overlap with these pi stars in a pi fashion, okay? So in this way, we are filling actually D electrons or D electron density into the pi star orbitals of the ligand. So we actually transfer electron density from the metal and we transfer into um, interbonding orbitals of the ligand. Okay, when we fill interbonding orbitals, then we also decrease the bond order. So, because of these two effects, we can um, say that well, we create a metal ligand interaction at the expense of the interaction between the carbon atoms. So, we're weakening the carbon carbon. Uh, bonds in order to make bonding interaction between the carbon atoms and the, and the metal. All right, um, then another important step was the discovery of the first carbonyl by Ludwig Mohn. And the first carbonyl that was discovered was the nickel tetracarbonyl which is a tetrahedral volatile um, molecule with a composition NiCO4. So um, this um, carbonyl forms very easily. It forms actually from nickel metal and carbon monoxide near room temperature. And this reaction is uh, selective for nickel and can be used for the purification of nickel. So Ludwig Mohr, who discovered the nickel tetracarbonyl, already found that, and he developed a process which is named after him, which is the Mohn process. And the Mohn process is still being used to purify nickel um, via the nickel tetracarbonyl as an intermediate. So um, here is how this process roughly works. So you can take nickel, which is impure, and then slightly above room temperature, just 50 to 60, 50 to 60 degrees, the nickel in the impure metal reacts selectively with four CO molecules to form the nickel carbon, <coughs> which is uh, a gas at that temperature. Okay, so that basically removes the nickel from the impure metal in a, in a, in a gaseous form. Okay, but the nickel tetracarbonyl is not thermally all that stable, so you can decompose it then at even higher temperature. Okay, so you can actually decompose it at a hot 
nickel, pure nickel substrate um, at a temperature of 220 to 250 degrees Celsius. And then the elemental nickel forms back in a highly purified form and the carbon monoxide also forms. Uh, forms and you can reuse it to react it with more um, impure, impure nickel. So this process is still being used um, today, um, despite the very high toxicity of nickel tetracarbonate. All right. Then another important step forward was the discovery of Grinia reagents by uh, Victor uh, Grinia. And you know this reaction probably from organic, organic chemistry. So it's really an amazing reaction because intuition wouldn't argue that it can work. So when you take, well, elemental magnesium and just stir that element, elemental magnesium in a solution of uh, an alkyl halide in ether, then in an exothermic reaction, the magnesium dissolves and forms a Grignard reagent in which the magnesium is inserted in between the organic group R and the halogenide X. So the magnesium inserts into a metal halogen uh, bond. So this uh, reaction is very useful in organic chemistry because um, in an alkyl halide, the, uh, there's a delta plus on, a, on the carbon. Yeah? So the alkyl group is an electrophile, okay? while it's part of the Grignard reagent. Okay? Because of electronegativity, um, the magnesium carbon bond is polarized toward the carbon. So there's now a delta minus on the carbon. And so the alkyl group reacts as a nucleophile. And this has, of course, many applications in, in uh, organic synthesis. OK, uh, so an, another example of an important discovery was the, or is the um, discovery of lithium um, alcohol compounds by Wilhelm Schling. So he made the lithium alkyls uh, first from dialkyl uh, mercury compounds. So lithium alkyls are also very important reagents in organic synthesis, probably or know that, um, you probably also know that uh, lithium alcohol compounds are very air sensitive. Because of that, Wilhelm Schlenk designed the so-called Schlenk line. You may also be familiar with a Schlenk line in the laboratory now. So basically this Schlenk line <coughs> allows you to work under inert gas atmosphere and protect your, your chemicals from from, from air, if they are air sensitive. Lithium alkyls are very air sensitive. So basically you have here two, two glass tubings here and here, okay? And these two are interconnected with other glass tubings that can be, for instance, four, but it can also be three or more depending on the size of your, of your Schlenk line. And there are here these valves in these positions these eight positions in this case, that separate these two lines, okay? So now one of the two lines is being evacuated, okay, it's under vacuum, that is usually the top line, and the bottom line is usually filled with an inert gas, okay? So you connect the bottom line here, for instance, at this end to a nitrogen or argon cylinder, okay? And well, now with these valves here, with these four, you can evacuate uh, a flask that can be, for instance, attached here, okay, via tubing, okay. So you just open this valve here, and then your, your, your 
your flask is getting evacuated. And this way you remove the air. What you can then do is you close this valve here, all right, and open this valve, and then your flask fills with inert gas, for instance, nitrogen or, or argon. And then you can fill your chemical into the flask while it's while argon is actually streaming through your flask. And this way you protect your chemicals from from uh, air. So this was actually a development of Wilhelm Schlink, who wanted to protect his lithium alcohols from air. All right. Um, so these were all very important developments, but the field of organometallic chemistry really took off just in the year uh, 1951 and developed into a uh, mature field of contemporary organometallic chemistry. So um, what happened in 1951? A uh, very unusual compound was discovered, and its name is uh, ferrocene. And the ferrocene has a very unusual uh, has very unusual chemical bonding in its molecule. It was actually so unusual that uh, a lot of people became highly intrigued into that kind of chemistry and the field prospered since that time and it's still an active, an active field. Okay, so now uh, ferrocene was discovered by Thomas Keeley and Peter Pawson. And as often in chemistry, it was discovered by an accident. So this is what exactly happened. So uh, Keeley and Pawson wanted to make a molecule called fulvaline and you see the structure actually over there. So you have actually two cyclopentadienyl units connected via a carbon-carbon double bond. And they wanted to make this molecule by reacting iron chloride, iron three chloride, with this cyclopentadienyl guinea reagent. So um, what happened though is that they only produced hydrofulvaline because um, this radical here formed as an intermediate which then dimerized, but they also observed a strange side product. So they observed that there was a orange powder produced as a side product and that orange product was remarkably stable. And they investigated the chemical composition further, and they found that it contained one iron and two cyclopentadienyl units, according to um, elemental analysis. And according to what was known about chemical bonding at this time, they assigned this structure to this molecule, in which the iron would be bound to the two cyclopentadienyl units by two um, iron carbon bonds. Okay, so they suggested this structure based on what was known about chemical bonding in organometallic compounds, but soon uh, doubts were raised about the structure because this structure didn't explain the a remarkable stability of the of the compound. Okay, so um, the compound was remarkably stable despite having only ten valence electrons. So if you apply your electron counting skills, then you will find we only have ten valence electrons, and that would mean that this species should be highly reactive and not highly, highly inert. Okay, you can just quickly do this. Um, you can, for instance, apply the oxidation state method. So if you count the number of iron electrons, then that's 
eight because iron is in the eighth group. Then um, we can assign the iron, the oxidation state plus two. Why is that? Because when we apply the oxidation state method, we always assign the electrons in the bonds to the ligand. Yeah? So when you cleave this iron carbon bond heteroleptically, yeah, here, and assign these two electrons to the ligand, you will create an anion, a cyclopentadienyl anion with six with six pi electrons. And the other iron carbon bond, of course, cleaves the same way, making another anion. So now overall, the compound is neutral. Okay. So this means that the two negative charges at the two um, ligands must be compensated by two positive charges at the metal, and that must mean that the metal is in the oxidation state of plus two. So this now in turn means that we have to subtract two electrons from these eight. That would give six. How many electrons would be contributed by the ligands? Well, we assign both bonding electrons to the ligand. Okay, then that would mean that the ligand contributes, this ligand contributes two. And so would the other ligand contributing another two. So that gives overall two times two is equal to four. And that would sum up to eight minus two plus four is equal to 10. All right. Uh, now, in addition to that, the structure is, so this means that this, this structure is actually inconsistent with the air stability because we only 10 electrons. Um, we can also sublime it without decomposition, so it's also inconsistent with thermostability. stability. Um, also, the reactivity is unusually low, so one would expect that one could hydrogenate the carbon carbon double bonds with relative ease. Okay, but this compound just refuses to get its carbon carbon double bonds hydrogenated. Okay, and then there are also spectroscopic observations that speak against this structure here. So we only observe one NMR signal for the hydrogen from the carbons, and we also observe only one CH stretch vibration in the, in the IR. But according to this structure, we should observe more than that, okay? Because for instance, this carbon here is structurally uh, inequivalent from these two, and these two are again structurally different, chemically unequivalent to these two. And that applies, of course, for the hydrogens as well. So we would expect actually three signals, but we observe only one. So because of these inconsistencies, uh, scientists started thinking about, well, what could be wrong with the structure and what is the real structure? And there were two who proposed the current structure, and these were plants or the fissure. It, uh, University of Munich and uh, Jeffrey Wilkerson at Harvard University, they proposed a radically different structure which departed from the, very much from the conventional uh, picture of um, bonding in organometallic compounds. So they proposed a so-called um, sandwich structure as shown here, in which the iron would be sandwiched between two cyclopentadienyl um, anions. Okay, so formally the iron would be in the oxidation state plus two, and that would make these two cyclopentadienyl rings aromatic because they would have a four and plus two pi electrons, in this case, six electrons, and it would be um, the, the, the six pi electrons which would be donated into the metal uh, orders to exactly the same uh, degree, uh, forming a sandwich 
sandwich compound. So in these, in this picture, the central pentadienyl ligand would act as a so-called pentahaptoligand. ligand. That means that each carbon atom would be involved equally in the bonding with, with the metal. All right? And that's, of course, a very different um, way to explain the, an unconventional way to explain the bonding in this molecule. So this molecule uh, would be called, the, was named in a, a ferrazine based on that picture about the bonding because the pi electrons would be the ones that are involved in the bonding, hence the ending, ending ene. Yeah, ene stands always for, uh, well, an L, uh, key in something which has um, unsaturated carbon atoms. All right, so this structure, while drastically different, would actually be consistent with the 18 electron rule and would also be consistent with this spectroscopic uh, data. So we can again count the electrons. So again, the iron would contribute eight electrons. Again, uh, the iron would be in the oxidation state plus two. This is because we would consider the ligands as cyclopentadienyl dienyl anions with a one minus charge each. So we remove two electrons. And then overall 12 electrons would come from the ligands because each ligand would have six pi electrons and two times these six electrons would give overall 12 electrons. So we sum this up, this gives 18 electrons and would be consistent with the 18 electron rule. So um, that uh, these 18 electrons would then be consistent with the stability and the low reactivity, but also with the spectroscopic observations, all right? So all the carbons now are structurally equivalent and all the hydrogens are structurally um, equivalent. So it's consistent with observing only one in a mass signal, one carbon hydrogen stretch vibration. Of course, this structure was very speculative, yeah. Um, but the final proof came then eventually with a crystal structure determination using X-ray diffraction. And after the structure was confirmed, uh, and so the Fisher and Jeffrey Ferguson won the Nobel Prize for proposing this structure. Okay, because um, it was such a big intellectual step departing from old bonding models. So this covers of Ferrazine uh, did not get actually the Nobel Prize in this case. Uh, partly also because they proposed the wrong structure. Uh, they could not disconnect from the conventional wisdom. Okay. So now let's look uh, at the fellows in more detail. We've learned a lot about molecular orbital theory and ligand field theory. Then let's see if molecular orbital theory and ligand field theory would also confirm the stability of the, of the structure. All right. Now the ferrazine, um, <coughs> the ferrazine, the cyclopentadienyl units are actually in the staggered conformation, we make here a slight approximation or simplification and assume that they're both in the eclipsed conformation. That's okay because the um, energy of the respective orbitals doesn't change much and the molecular orbitals are overall almost the same. All right, so we, if you assume this eclipse structure and not the staggered structure, then our point group will be D5H. Okay, 
So we can define the coordinate system so that the z-axis points upward, okay, perpendicular to the plane of the cyclopentadienal rings. The x-axis goes along one carbon carbon bond, and then the y-axis stands perpendicular to the xz plane. All right. So now the next step would be to determine the similarity types of power uh, metal orbitals. So that's it. for the iron, the 4s, the 4p, and the 3d orbitals, we can easily read the symmetry types from the character table. So in this case, the 3d yz, the 3d xz have e1 prime prime symmetry. You can easily verify this. You can see uh, here the yz, the xz in parentheses for symmetric e1 prime prime. Then the 3d x square minus y square and the 3d x y, they have e2 prime symmetry. We see here x square minus y square and x y in parentheses. That means that they are double degenerate. Go to the left, we see the associated symmetry type is E uh, two, two prime. Then this 3D Z square would have A one prime symmetry. You see Z square is here and it's in the line for the symmetry type A one prime. Then the 4S also has A1 prime symmetry. The 4S, because it's an S orbital, has the totally symmetric symmetry type, so it's the first one, which is A1 prime in this case. Then the 4PX and the 4PY, they have E1 prime symmetry. So we find X and Y here in parentheses for the symmetry type E1 prime. And last but not least, we have the 4PZ, which is A2 prime prime symmetry. Um, we see the letter, we see the letter Z here, and you see we see it's in the row for A2 prime prime. So now we know the symmetries of our metal orbitals. We now need to determine the symmetries of our ligand group orbitals that are that will overlap with our metal orbitals. Okay. So now uh, we need to think about from which orbitals we want to construct our ligand group orbitals in this case. Okay. And you have to keep in mind here that in the ferrocene is believed that the bonding is being made in between the uh, well pi electrons of the ligand and the metal D orbitals. So uh, the, the pi orbitals in the ligand is being made from well, pi overlap of the P orbital that stand perpendicular to the, to the cyclopentadienal plane, okay? So if we say, well, um, the Z axis is, the axis which stands perpendicular to the cyclopentadienal ring, then we say that the PZ orbitals, they make, they make the pi bonds within the molecule, okay? So we can therefore construct um, first the pi molecular orbitals of the ligand and then combine ligand group orbitals made out of these Pi orbitals with metal D orbitals to make molecular orbitals. Okay, let's first look at one ligand isolated. So we have overall five PZ orbitals to consider. So if you combine two, five PZ orbitals, how many ligand group orbitals would be expected? Well, also five. Okay, you could again apply our uh, symmetry adapted linear combination 
of atomic orbitals mass at determining first the reducing presentation and the irreducible presentation um, to determine uh, the symmetry types and what these Higgin group orbitals are. Um, there's actually one which is completely bonding, and you see this this one here. Then you see that there are two which have one node, and there are two more that have that have two nodes. Actually, we have forgotten here the second node. All right. So now for a neutral cyclopentadiene arrival car, we would have five electrons. So you would fill this one, this one, and that one would be half filled. But if we assume that our ligand is uh, an anion, cyclopentadiene anion, this orbit here would also be completely full. Okay, we have um, six electrons. So this would constitute what is called an aromatic pi system of, of four n plus two electrons. So n is just the integer number. So the integer number n would be here in this case equal to one. So four times one plus two is six. So we would have here these six pi electrons would behave in an aromatic way. Um, so aromaticity is associated with stability. We can see also from this molecular order picture why this would be the case. So this, more, uh, this MO here is highly bonding, but also these ones that have one node are still are still bonding, while these two having two nodes are weakly inter, uh, are strongly interbonding. So we can fill all our electrons into our bonding molecular orbitals. Or all of our bonding molecular orbitals are being full, and that can explain the stability and the aromaticity of the ligand. Okay, um, now we have not only one ligand to consider in our ferrocene, we actually have two to consider. Okay, and now we can combine our zero node, one node, and two node orbitals uh, in two different ways to create overall 10 ligand group orbitals. Okay, so we can take two of these. Yeah, so this is called a zero node because it doesn't have any node. And, com and, and combine two of them either in a, in a bonding fashion or an interbonding fashion. You see in, in the bonding fashion here, the lobes of the same algebraic sign point toward each other. And here, lobes of al opposite algebraic sign point toward each other. So this would be our first ligand group orbital. And this one would be our second ligand group, or the symmetry types of these two would be A1 prime and A2 prime prime, respectively. So now we can do the same also with the one node ligand group orbitals. Okay. So the one node ones would be these two. Okay. We can combine by the first one node ligand group orbital in two different ways. Okay, in a bonding way where the lobes of algebraic signs, the point toward each other have the same algebraic sign or have the opposite algebraic sign. We can do this, the same thing also for the other one node uh, molecular orbital. And th that gives us four molecular, uh, four ligand group orbitals that have E1 prime prime and E1 prime symmetry, respectively. So last but not least, we can also take our two two node orbitals and combine them. Okay. So here, the first one is combined in a bonding fashion. You see lobes of the same algebraic sign point toward each other. Here, lobes of opposite algebraic sign point toward each other. Here for the second one, again, lobes of the same algebraic sign point toward each other. Here in this combination, lobes of opposite algebraic sign point toward each other. Okay, you can determine, you can determine symmetries of these four ligand group orbitals also, and that's the E1 prime prime, E1 prime, respectively. 
When our over oil C, that gives exactly the 10 ligand group orbits that we would expect. So that's basically all that we need in order to construct our molecular orbit diagram. So we plot here on the left side, the uh, frontier orbitals of the iron, and here on the right side, the ligand group orbitals of the ligand. So the frontier orbitals of the iron are 3D, 4S, 4P. They have the respective symmetry types we previously determined. On the right-hand side, now we have our ligand, ligand group orbitals having the symmetry types of previously determined. So here we have the zero node, here we have the one node, and here we have the two node. Okay, we have two zero node LGOs, four one node LGOs, and four two node LGOs. We can plot the zero node ones with the lowest energy because they have no nodes, the one node ones with a somewhat higher energy, and the two node LGOs with the highest energy. So now we know similar types of all orbitals involved. That's all that we need to know in order to construct molecular orbitals. We can do this again just by going through the similar types one by one. So for instance, we can start with the similar type A1 prime. We see that we have one D orbital, which is A1 prime symmetry. The 4S orbital has A1 prime symmetry, and one of the zero node ligand group orbitals has also A1 prime symmetry. Okay, so that gives a bonding 1A1 and approximately non bonding 2A1 could be weakly bonding or interbonding. We can't decide that exactly. Uh, in this case, it's actually weakly bonding, and here we have our strong interbonding 3A1 prime. So and again, connect uh, the orbitals accordingly. Then you can, for instance, go to the A2 prime prime symmetry. There's here this 4P orbital, and here this second zero node looking group orbital, but that gives a bonding one, and here an end up bonding one. You can connect these. Okay, next, for instance, we can look at the E1 prime prime symmetry. We see have these two W degenerated D orbitals. We have these W degenerated one node ligand group orbitals. So that gives a pair of one name E1 prime prime and another pair of interbonding E1 prime prime. Okay, we can again connect them accordingly. Okay, so now what's left? Well, we still have the E1 prime left. So we have here these four P E1 primes. We have here these one node ligand group orbitals with the same symmetry. So that it gives again a bonding pair and an interbonding pair, then we connect and connect them. So now we still have the um, yeah the E two prime the E two prime we have here these two E two primes and we have here these two E two primes so again that gives a pair bonding pair and an interbonding pair okay now is there any anything left and that's actually the E two prime prime here and they remain non-bonding, they don't find a bonding partner with a S, P, or D orbit. Okay, so now last but not least, we have to fill in our electrons. And now, how many ligand electrons do we have? We if we consider our cyclopentyl dianol ligands as aromatic anions, each ligand contributes six electrons, that gives overall 12. Okay. So that fills these six orbitals, and we can fill these 12 electrons here into the bonding molecular orbitals here, and here, here, 
here, so that spins eight. Now we have 10, and now we have 12. Two, four, six, eight, 10, 12. So now the only um, electrons to be considered are the metal D electrons. <coughs> so how many do we have? When we say the iron is a, uh, uh, D6 uh, ion because it's an iron 2 plus. Okay. Uh, so, therefore, we have here six electrons to consider. Overall, we could have, well, up to 10 D electrons in D orbitals. So, this would this would, would fill these two orbitals, this MO, and these two. So, we could say again that these are the metal D orbitals in a well, ligand field with D5H symmetry in this case. So we do not have to fill all of them. We only need to fill six electrons. So that's this one, this one, that this will be our highest occupied molecular orbital. These two will be our lowest unoccupied molecular orbital. Okay. So we count our electrons and we have again 12 plus six is 18 electrons. We find that these electrons are all in bonding molecular orbitals. This one here is still slightly bonding. You see all interbonding molecular orbitals here are being empty. Again, that represents an ideal situation for chemical bonding. So we can derive from that that also the ligand field theory actually supports the stability of the ferrocene structure. Okay, then let's stop at this point.